Well, thank you very much uh, to have, having me invited me to this very esteemed uh, meeting with really fabulous speakers beforehand. I feel a little out of place as I'm not a, a war um, specialist, but I am a public health specialist and have worked many years on the ground in the field um, in many countries. And what's interesting is that uh, human uh, disease, disability, and death is something that we face on an ongoing uh, process as mortals. And so winning is not something that's decisive because in the end we die. And so it's always staving that death or disability that we're trying to accomplish uh, well-being, well-being in living in our lives in society uh, uh, and in families. Um, and so what's interesting is that the, the terms that are used in war, such as battling disease or our war with COVID, which Emmanuel Macron uh, in his first discourse uh, mentioned about dealing with this pandemic that we have, that we were at war, was interesting because we, um, we, we think of it as something that we can eradicate and get rid of. But what if in fact we have to live with disease and disability all our lives and and that in fact it's not a decisive victory all the time in fact the only infectious diseases that we have eradicated to date have been smallpox and rinderpest which are viruses all the other diseases have not been eradicated and interestingly enough we've been controlling and trying to eliminate them in um, specific geographic areas eradication is a big word and requires a lot of coordination um, and interestingly enough, there are emerging diseases that will happen that we don't even know will happen, like the zoonotic diseases of COVID, the diseases that are coming and jumping out of the animal kingdom. Um, and with regards to the relationship we have with nature and the encroaching on nature that creates more and more possibility for disease jumping into the human population. So we're always having emerging threats and emerging diseases coming um, and evolving. So how does um, public health deal with the ongoing battle of disease and disability? And I wanted to show you uh, where the burden of disease is. This is an old map because we don't have COVID in here and COVID is an emerging disease. But we can see that most of the burden of disease is in sub-Saharan Africa, where a number of conflicts are raging um, and are protracted, like Mali, um, and then in other places like Yemen, uh, Niger, other places where the, there's greatest poverty and political instability, as well as where there's the greatest burden of disease. So it's an interesting uh, parallel with uh, where we're trying to deal with unstable instability and where we're dealing with the greatest uh, burden of disease. And uh, interestingly enough, the burden of disease in the world in 2017, the greatest deaths were from cardiovascular diseases um, and things that were related to our modern lifestyle of sedentary, obesity, diabetes, and so on and so forth. Um, and as you can see, uh, malaria and infected tropical diseases still remain among uh, important diseases that are in the world, particularly in the tropical uh, areas of the planet. So when I was asked to talk about um, how does public health and what can we learn from public health about coping with the indecisiveness, I asked uh, our, um, our, our uh, counterpoints at the war school, what were the key questions they had for me? And these are the questions that they came out with. And this is how I wanted to structure uh, my talk. First of all, how do you envisage the planning process of tackling a public health issue? How do you manage between diverging priorities, the impact on health, society, economy, mental health? How do you organize various tools at your disposal, communication versus direct intervention? And when you can't win definitively, how do you define the threshold under which you can live with or despite the issue? So what I want to do was try and answer some of these questions and in some ways as it'll be quite pedantic, but I wanted to have some discussion on some of the tools we use in public health to try and understand problems and tackle issues. 
Um, and so the first thing that is really important when we're planning in health project planning, and I'm sure when you're doing your strategic planning in, uh, in uh, military exercises, is to really diagnose the situation and have an analysis. And what we look at is really importantly the population and age and sex structure. So we understand the population we're deal dealing with and look at the epidemiology. So the distribution of disease in the population. So morbidity, the disease and the mortality, the deaths and understand the geographical distribution of these diseases. So we know on a macro level, what is our population look like? And then we try and understand what are the medical care facilities? What is the quality? What is the quantity? What is the reach? What is the access? What kind of human resources and technical manpower do we have to deal with the problem? What are the training facilities available? And what is really important, what are the attitudes and belief of the population towards diseases in cure and prevention? We need to understand the population. And this is extremely important in understanding the diagnosis of the situation. So when we look at public health, we also need to understand the social context. What is the economic context? What are the cultural behaviors and beliefs that influence uh, health seeking practices? What are some of the behavioral um, aspects that would either increase access to uh, health, uh, health facilities or uh, perhaps uh, dangerous practices uh, that would have an impact on disease and uh, disability? What is the political situation? Who are the key stakeholders? And this is extremely important. When beginning a health project or a public health intervention, key stakeholders must be engaged at the very beginning and they must become partners of a process because a intervention will fail if first the community is a key stakeholder and the other key stakeholders are not part of the intervention. And so when we talk about engaging with stakeholders, and I think this is extremely important when you're working in different communities and different countries to identify very early the diverse number of stakeholders that are out there and how close are they to the problem that you're identifying? How much power do they have to impact change? And then getting stakeholders to talking to one another about the problems and impacts are extremely important. And before even trying to explain yourself as the project implementer or the public health intervention leader, you need to understand before you're understood, understand the context you're in and listen and really listen to what's happening from what the different stakeholders are saying. Lead with integrity and trust. Trust is primordial to have an intervention to be successful. Trust is number one. Work with stakeholders to understand their rules and tasks in addressing the public issue. And this is a dialogue. This is something in which is negotiated and that expectations of the stakeholders need to be developed. And communication is number one when engaging with stakeholders. I think this is important in any kind of intervention that you would undertake. Uh, in the field. Number two, identifying and prioritizing and analyzing collective health problems are very important. So we talked about the epidemiological diagnosis where key data is important, but often missing in low income and resource settings. So imagine working in Mali or Niger or Yemen or in these settings in which the actual quantifiable data of the population is very low. Um, this kind of data driven, we talk about big data, which is very important and is very accessible in um, high income areas. It is somewhat more accessible with mobile phone uh, applications. Some of this data is becoming more accessible um, in the field. But what's also important is the perception of the analysis of the key stakeholders and the community through interviews and observation. This information is often missing in official documents and can provide an understanding of the immediate needs. So there's a combination of getting the quantitative uh, 
observational and the uh, population-based disease data, but also the perception data. And the synthesis of both these diagnostic approaches allows you to understand what the collective health problem will be. So here's a problem tree of high child more mortality in Cote d'Ivoire. And a problem tree is something that's often used in uh, public health planning and community health pro uh, program planning. Because when the problem is dissected this way, we get an idea of where interventions can take place and how these interventions can deal with dealing with the ultimate morbidity or mortality issue. Um, here you can see there's deaths from malaria related to, at the very bottom, unmanaged stagnant water sources, which is outside of the realm of health, but in the realm of environment, which has an impact on health. And then the lack of mosquito nets, where a lot of interventions look at distributing insecticide-treated mosquito nets to deal with prevention um, and dealing with high infection levels. Then we look at lack of investment in social sectors and how that has an impact on investment on infrastructure. We look at insufficient sanitation and how this links to impacts on uh, contaminated water sources and ultimately diarrhea, ultimately having an impact on childhood mortality. In all of these uh, um, uh, examples, interventions can be had by addressing these particular causes and ultimately impacting overall child mortality. And that is how we identify the collective problems when we begin to identify the type of intervention we would have. So this is a model and I'm not gonna go through the whole uh, planning process, but the diagnosis and identification of problems and then the interventions from the causes of these problems allows you to define the objectives and the general overall objective and specific objectives are extremely important when you talk about strategically intervening and identifying these objectives and specific objectives must be done with the key stakeholders, including your internal team and the external stakeholders that are very much part of the process and the community in which who are being targeted are extremely important stakeholders in this process. And ultimately setting up the program, tracking and monitoring with indicators and smart indicators, and eventually evaluating the project is all part of the health project planning cycle that allows for an iterative process of implementing a very relevant and effective uh, program. So now the question is, you have diverging priorities. And we see with the COVID situation, the lockdowns have created a lot of uh, collateral damage in an economic and social and um, mental health psychological perspective. And some of our interventions um, are, um, are, we need to take into consideration these uh, collateral impacts. But what you need to understand in public health is that we look at health from an overall perspective. We might think of uh, disease being microbes uh, impacting um, our bodies, uh, contaminating us, infecting us. But in fact, uh, health is uh, determined by many factors and many determinants. First of all, the age and sex and the constitutional or genetic factors that we have, but there's individual lifestyle factors, there's social and community networks, and then there's education, the work environment, water and sanitation, healthcare services, housing, all of these have an impact on health as well as the general socioeconomic environment. So when we are conceiving of a public health intervention, we're taking into consideration the determinants of health and how these determinants actually interact with one another to have an overall impact on morbidity and mortality and disability in a population. So how do you manage that? Well, political debate. We talked about that and, and others have talked about that, I think, uh, in the first introduction about where can we, in a, in a, in a political debate, argue uh, for allocation of resources towards different interventions? And where does education of the ones in the debate uh, play a role in understanding the different collateral, collateral impacts? And the multi-stakeholder involvement and negotiation is extremely important in that. In addition is the intersectoral collaboration, not just the health sector playing their role in public health, but other sectors as well. Housing, energy, um, 
water and sanitation, um, occupational health, all of these sectors play an important role in understanding what kinds of interventions. We talked about stagnant water sources uh, in, in increasing the um, presence of uh, malaria carrying mosquitoes. Well, in fact, the environment sector has a big role in changing uh, these kinds of stagnant pools to decrease infection rates in the population. And what's really important is constantly tracking and monitoring the social, economic, and psychological impact of the interventions that we're doing and responding with support and programming. In, um, in the COVID situation, the psychological impacts of lockdown and social isolation and also domestic violence has been tracked. And there's more and more online support, for example, for um, um, sufferers of domestic violence and trying to get to those people who are isolated. So tracking is extremely important. The next question, how do you organize various tools at your disposal? Communication, oh sorry, communication versus direct intervention. So I'll go very quickly. We know there are biomedical tools like diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics, but we know until these are widely available, we need to work on risk communication and community engagement. And this is extremely important and must be community centered. It must be informed by data, both qualitative and quantitative. Trust is extremely important and must be participatory. It must be open and transparent. It must be integrated. It must be accountable. And this is just an example of something that was developed uh, with uh, different stakeholders to deal with the coronavirus. And then the last question was, when you can't win definitively, how do you define the threshold under which you can live? So all different countries have had different strategies on dealing with this pandemic. And the strategies all are accepting a number, a, a level at which they accept uh, infection and disease. And um, in this, they've, surveillance has been extremely important. Exclusion strategy, for example, maximum action to exclude disease, the Pacific Islanders and territories, they've basically decided they don't want any disease. The elimination strategy in which just specific geographical areas are eliminating the disease have been accepted by China and Taiwan. The suppression strategy, action increase in a stepwise and targeted manner to substantial lower the case numbers and outbreaks in Europe and North America. The mitigation strategy, which Sweden initially undertook, was to flatten the peak. And then no substantive strategy was largely uncontrolled pandemic in some lower income countries. Those, these different strategies show a social acceptance of what is considered acceptable in disease and death. Um, and of course, these are evolving and changing. This is an example of, statistics, mm -hmm. of indicators that are used for governments to decide on the level or phase in which a country would go into. And I wanted to just show you some indicators that are quantitative that allow you to understand where these decision thresholds are made. So in the green prevent zone, this is from the Ministry of Ontario in Canada. Um, they, they looked at the weekly incidence rate is less than 10 per 100,000. The percent positivity of the tests are 0.5%. The reproduction number is less than one. And the level of community transmission and non-NEPI linked cases are stable. We say that the hospital intensive care unit capacity is adequate and the public health system capacity case and contact follow up within 24 hours is adequate. That is at the prevention level. I'm not gonna go through all of them because I have little time, but just to show how things change in the red and control zone, you see that the hospital ICU capacity is risk of being overwhelmed and the public health system is at a risk of being overwhelmed as well. And then in a lockdown, we see that the adverse trends after entering the red control, such as increased weekly incidents and case incidents of test positivity, increasing cases and test positivity among people age 70 or over, increased outbreaks among vulnerable populations. The health system is over, overwhelmed and the public health capacity is overwhelmed and we go into lockdown. These types of indicators are extremely important. And this is my last slide to show you where is the threshold and where do we decide? When is it a win? When is it, isn't it a win? Without protective measures, we have 
more people ill in a short period of time, and we don't have the health system to treat them. The threshold and with the measures that we have, we spread it out, but we can treat people. We have the capacity and that's how we decide whether things are going to be a win, uh, a decisive win or indecisive win.